We are live. Welcome to Spider-Man Into the Spider-Verse Review and Thoughts. This movie, no matter where you look online, regardless of who you ask, everyone seems to love this movie, and I do too. It's objectively amazing. Of course, for a while I wasn't sure when or if at all I would actually watch this movie, so I've been watching spoiler-filled videos about it for three years by now. I spoiled for myself a lot of surprises, so I'm really impressed by how much I love the movie despite all the things that I knew would be in it. Two fake-outs right at the start of the video, back-to-back, -back, I don't know, is that too much? You decide. I realize this video is long, I'm going to do what I can to make it worth your time. Also, if you're only interested in the review, that part of the video is not the whole length of the video. To see its length, check the time codes in the description box. I'm currently dealing with some back pain, but I still have a lot to say about the movies that I watch, so I'm going to speak faster until my back feels better. Now, I start this video with a review, most likely with zero spoilers. And if I spoil anything, I will warn before I do so, and hold up an index finger until I'm done with the spoilers. You can mute and skip ahead and you see me lower my index finger. As soon as I end the review itself, please note the rest of the video will have lots of spoilers for the subject as well as for other Spider-Man solo movies, possibly also for the comics that this is adapted from, including discussing endings. I don't intend to spoil solo Spider-Man movies in the review itself, but I will definitely say you should watch them before watching this movie. You'll appreciate this movie more. And for sure, this movie is made primarily for people who are very familiar with Spider-Man. I do not make this the first Spider-Man movie you watch, unless you're just, you really love having a ton of new information in a movie. No matter how much, like, you can have read every Spider-Man comic that's ever come out, and there's still going to be stuff in this movie because they don't do everything exactly like the comics. You know, there's still going to be stuff in this movie that will surprise you. So, having watched the other Spider-Man movies, the, the solo movies, it's not necessary to watch the, the team-up ones. So, if this is the first of these videos by me that you watch, then just to get you up to speed, I love every MCU movie. They're all in the 7 out of 10 or 10 to 10 range. Yeah, the range between those two. Although I don't make any excuses for Iron Man 2, and I love every episode that's come out so far of the Disney Plus and Zoo shows, 10 out of 10 for WandaVision, Captain America Winter Soldier, Season 1 of Loki, and the episodes of What If that have aired. So, content warning and or trigger warning for let's see, the, the um, torture, kidnapping... Gaslighting, xenophobia, mild body horror, and uh, yeah, that is it. Now, let's see. Also, please note that I have a tendency to sometimes, when I'm discussing a sensitive subject, use descriptive terms that I consider neutral that other people consider to be negative. So if I say something that sounds judgmental, it may very well just be that I take for granted that people know I'm being descriptive, not judgmental. I'm not trying to be disrespectful. And also the movie that I'm talking about has sensitive subjects that I'm not well educated on. I'm going to try my best not to put my foot in my mouth, but if I at some point in this video say something that reeks of sock breath, Again, I assure you, I'm not intentionally being disrespectful. And yeah, the movie is rated PG, and so is this video. Now, this video is not going to contain any clips of any kind. The most visual it gets is when I sometimes act something out. So feel free to watch something visual, such as clips from the movie, in another tab. I won't mind. Now, I got this movie on sale so anything negative I say in this video is not out of bitterness I don't feel like the movie wasted my time 
Nobody forced me to watch it or to make this video. It's not that I'm upset at how it compares to what it's adapting, other movies like it, what I was expecting, the trailers and other marketing, earlier or later movies about Spider-Man, spiritual successors, predecessors. I don't have some personal vendetta against anyone who worked on making it. To the best of my ability, the negative things I say in this, there's not going to be very many, but the ones I do say are meant to be fair criticisms based on budget, when he came out, what he was trying to achieve, etc. Now, yeah, so basically, you don't, you, you can go in blind, go blind into this movie. The, you know, but certainly, I would say at the very, very least, you know, if you, if, if you haven't watched the other movies, at the very least, you'll, you'll, you know, you should know Spider-Man's powers. But, like, Peter Parker's backstory, you get a summary of it. And, you know, if, if you just... Yeah. Ultimately, the movie isn't... It's not about Peter Parker. It's about Miles Morales. And him you do get plenty of information about in this movie. I honestly, the only thing I really knew about Miles Morales before I watched this was that he exists in the comics and that, like, apparently he was inspired by, I can't believe I'm blanking on his name, um, Childish Gambino, I forget his given name, but that's his rapper alias. He wore Spider-Man pajamas in an episode of, I want to say it was called Community, and, you know, they they were, like, saying, they're casting a new Peter Parker, who says he can, where in the rule book does it say Peter Parker can't be black? And ultimately, they went with another white guy for Peter Parker, you know, um, Amazing Spider-Man was the one he was hoping to be cast in. And some of the people making comic books were like, you know, that's actually a good idea. Why don't we have, why, why not have a black teenage Spider-Man? I think it was the first black Spider-Man. I'm not 100% certain. Anyway, because there's a, yeah, I can't really talk about that without spoiling. Anyway, let's see. So, yeah. Please note that while I'm aware many people have watched this movie, this review will be based on the idea that you haven't. That's right. If you're not already familiar with this movie, this video is for you. This is your lucky day, both of you. Now, so that this review isn't just purely for my own sake, I've tried to collect as much information as I could on as many different aspects as I that I've heard over the years from many different sources. Since we're still dealing with Corona, I want to say during this video, yeah, I just did. I will probably touch my face again. I want to assure you, I washed my hands since the last time I was outside, and I will wash my hands again before going out. So, let's see. The, yeah, I have only watched this movie once, and, you know, I just got done watching it, then, you know, had lunch, recorded the video for the most recent, recently aired What If episode, and now vlogging about the movie and you know I, I try to put as little time between me watching it and then recording the vlog so it'll be fresh in my mind there are some sequences that epileptics definitely shouldn't watch in this movie so the plot biracial multilingual English and Spanish Miles Morales is a big fan of Peter Parker aka Spider-Man so, it's kind of a huge deal when he meets him one day, but then he's suddenly gone. And Miles was bitten by a spider and starts to see signs that he might also now have the powers of Spider-Man. And then... Then he meets another Spider-Man, and he's surprised to find him very jaded. And he finds that there are other 
spider men spider mans spiders man and there's a threat that they have to stop now let's see so yeah the the on on IMDb this is listed as animation action adventure family sci-fi the action is fun and exciting the sci-fi does stimulate your brain you know it is actually yeah i was going to say no yeah it is it is hard sci-fi now that i think about it it's based on stuff that we do have in the real world it's been a long time since a movie made me laugh this hard got me this hard in the feels and it's also got some of the most exciting and cool action I've seen in a really long time. So yeah I went to the IMDb more like this list and as usual it is not particularly useful but here we are it compares this to the Lion King, which is an eight out of ten. The 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 animated one, not the live uh, not live action, not the I'm I'm talking about the the you know the old one, Matthew Broderick and all that. I am I have not watched the 2019. I want to say the new one is, and I hope I never do. Monsters Inc., which is also an eight. Spirited Away, which is a ten out of ten subs not dubs and no for the people who are way into anime that is not the only studio ghibli i've watched don't worry now i'm going to very briefly talk about the previous spider-man solo movies does this count as a solo movie because there's only it's only spider's man it's not like other you know, it's Spider's Man and his rogues gallery. You know, like, like, there's no team of Avengers in this. Anyway, yeah. So, Sam Raimi's trilogy does a really good job of taking the comic book and putting it on screen. He brings his strong sense of visuals and his willingness to embrace material that is more comic booky than a lot of mainstream audiences were expecting when he put out the first one. You know, seriously, like, if you go back and really look at, like, before Spider-Man, like, we were really, really, we, we could not have handled another, a third Joel Schumacher Batman movie. And, yeah, you know, you had, like, comic book adaptations but they were like dark and and you know very they they took themselves very seriously and, you know you had stuff like blade and the first x-men movie and you know i mean it, it took a while for the x-men movies to get really comic booky in in the visuals and anyway but yeah and then comes sam raimi's spider-man one where he's got the comic book accurate costume it's a movie with color, you know, the villains wear the, the full suit that, yeah. And, you know, for sure, Sam Raimi is the best of the three directors handling the three solo Spider-Man series and handling something so big and, yeah, again, something very comic booky. The Amazing Spider-Man 1 does a good job of being gritty, while the second one definitely gets too excited about setting up upcoming movies, fitting in a lot of different subplots, like Raimi's Spider-Man 3. I personally prefer the MCU movies. I think they do a really good job bringing in elements we didn't get in the first two series. Tony Stark as a mentor, when he's been without a healthy mentor himself, was very interesting. And Peter Parker with different problems who exist in the same world as the Avengers is very interesting in my opinion and I'm not saying that the other movies could have done that I'm saying one when, when they brought him I couldn't decide if I wanted to say when or once so I did them both wrong when they did bring him into the MCU the fact that he is he exists in the same world as the Avengers 
that's something that gets brought up. That's something that's a big deal. You know, when they could have tried to just have it off to the side. You know, not, not all of them have a strong connection to the Avengers from right away. Now, for those who don't know, I watch and video review pretty much every single comic book adaptation movie that goes to theaters. When this came out in 2018, I didn't watch it. I figured that it would simply be too fast-paced, have too many characters, and that my very limited experience and severe limitation how well I can analyze and verbalize it with animation would mean I couldn't fully appreciate it. I want to underline, it is not that I ever thought that the movie wouldn't be good. Even from immediately after it was released, I heard near universal, see what I did there, praise for it. The reason that I'm only doing a video on it now is that I eventually relented. I heard that it was the very best Spider-Man solo movie, and given that, you know, I read Spider-Man comics, let's see, I want to say it was around from around 1999 to was it 2007 or so i i stopped right before one more day i i don't know my my spidey sense went off saying stop reading now you're gonna hate the next story that's that's not that's not the case at all it was basically mainly a financial decision but yeah i'm I am a huge fan of the Spider-Man comics, so obviously I definitely don't want to mess out miss out on the very best movie based on him. And yeah, in the three years that passed between this coming out and me now doing a video, I've watched a lot of video essays, you know, most of which spoiled the movie. I genuinely didn't think that I would be watching it anytime soon, and Again, despite how much I knew going into it, this was still an incredible experience to watch. You know, like, I knew the, the broad strokes of the plot. I knew something important about every major character. <sighs> yeah, you know, like, the, the there were a number of minor details that I didn't know, but... Yeah, other than that, and and honestly, I currently the plan is when, not if, when they put out Spider Spider Verse Two, the plan my I am planning to watch it in theaters, and I will probably my first video on it will probably have a lot of there will be a lot of things that I'm not good at putting words to, but the. Yeah, this is definitely the kind of movie, if you have a chance, watch it in a theater. Now, let's see, I, I will be criticizing certain aspects of the movie that are directly tied to politics. So I want to let you know right away, I am progressive. So, you know, I might criticize some of the diversity in the movie. I'm not saying that there shouldn't be diversity. I'm saying I wish it was even more diverse. But it, it does fare pretty decently, you know. Yeah. Now, let's see. So, yeah, you know, it's not that I disagree with what the movie is trying to do. Rather, criticizing that it doesn't do it quite right, in my opinion. Now, some people say that Peter Parker is the only Spider-Man. I think it's kind of sad that six solo movies where the only Spider-Man is Peter Parker before this movie came out was not enough for some people. If you count team-up movies, then there are eight feature-length movies where Spider-Man is Peter Parker that came out before this one did. Come on, guys. The whole point of Spider-Man is that regular people can see themselves in him. Of course, non-whites should get a Spider-Man that looks like them, sounds like them, not to mention women. You know, it's just, it is wild to me, no matter, like, I'm white. 
speaking to fellow whites here, can we can we please calm down with the victim complex? We are ridiculously overrepresented in almost all fiction produced in the Western world. Like we we don't need more seriously. Like when this movie came out. You had three different continuities. Like, people have, for years, people were talking about which Spider-Man, you know, is, is superior. Which of the, of the three is superior and, and just, like, I, I could understand it if it was a comic book character that's supposed to be difficult to relate to. But the whole point of Peter Parker as the whole point of Spider-Man is that everyone can relate. Now, let's see. I, you know, I don't blame non-whites for not relating as much to Peter Parker as they do to Miles Morales. Now, from a critic's, yeah, from a movie critic's comment section. I love that Miles casually speaks Spanish with his friends and neighbors in the streets and with his mom, and it's not, not subtitled. If you get it, you get it, but if not, you're not missing crucial story points. You're simply presented with people living their lives in a language that may not be your own, just like in real life. That's a terrific celebration of diversity that I suspect will mean a lot to a lot of Latino kids, and the movie manages it without hitting you over the head with it. Just one of the many things the movie does astonishingly well. And one of the critics said, It won't do for Latinos what Black Panther did for the African American community earlier this year from a cultural perspective, but the highly stylized animated film is a solid first step in making the mainstream superhero universe more inclusive. Something that I thought was a really great touch, each time a new spider person is introduced, we get a proper introductory sequence. We see the cover of one of their comic books and sometimes also some of the pages. Now, let's see. The, according to Wikipedia, it is the first non-Disney or Pixar film to win the Academy Award for Best Animated Feature, feature since Rango in 2011, as well as the first non-Dixar non-Disney Pixar film since Happy Feet 2006 to win that award when a Disney Pixar film was also in contention. Now, let's see. This movie, right, this is a, a comment from a critic's site. This movie felt like animation flexing its muscles, shedding expectations and restraints, and showing off what an animation can do in the service of a story. This is one of the best things I've ever seen up on a big screen. So this was written by Phil Lord, who wrote the screenplay and the story. It's the only thing I've seen that he's written, but he is writing, or has written, I don't know if the script is done, Spider-Man to the Spider-Verse 2, and yeah. He also wrote Lego Movie 1 and 2 and Cloudy with a Chance of Meatballs 1 and 2 and something called Extreme Movie. So, yeah, you know, he... I haven't watched those movies. Once again, I very rarely watch anime. I guess that is the first time I'm saying this, that in this video. I very rarely watch animated stuff. I think the artistry is incredible. It's not that I think these are bad movies. It's just that... Like, it's kind of like with opera, like, I don't speak the language. I don't understand. It's, it, they're clearly talented. I can tell that they're talented, but I'm not really understanding a lot of it is, is essentially, I'm not, I'm not good at reading animation the way I'm, I'm much better at live action anyway, but I do hear you know, I haven't heard very many negative things about Lego Movie 1 and 2, Cloudy with the Chance of Meatballs 1 and 2. It was also written by Rodney Rothman, who, yeah, he wrote the screenplay, and he, let's see, he's one of the three directors of the movie, and he also, he wrote 
the screenplay for Jump Street, all right, 22 Jump Street, rather, and Grudge Match. Now, let's see. Yeah, so quoting a fellow critic here, the writing is mature. First of all, it's a Sony Animation product. If you look at this company's past work, some of it is very soulless with its marketing and panders to its audience with incessant pop culture references and juvenile comedy. Into the Spider-Verse is a welcome departure. Passion and integrity was put into this project. The writing is very grounded, treats its audience like people who want to see a genuinely captivating flick. Heck, the first third of the film is somewhat slow and nonchalant, almost like an art house film. I've never had such a cool yet offbeat and engaged feeling while watching an animated film on the big screen. Nothing was forced, nothing felt out of place, nothing took me out of immersion. The tone and pacing is very adult, even when something excessively goofy, like Spider-Ham, is on screen. It's like the Marvel Cinematic Universe. It can be dark and distressing, but lighthearted and amusing. There's a perfect balance, and it never sacrifices integrity to just to appeal to a niche audience. And, let's see. Uh, yeah, so, according to Wikipedia, the script is credited with Lord Anne Rothman for the story by Lord, making it the first film Lord had written without Miller. As six Spider-Man films had been made already, the team agreed they first needed to decide why this one needed to be made. Their answer was to sell, tell the story of Morales, who had yet to appear in the film. Brian Ma Michael Bendis, co-creator of Miles Morales, consulted on the film adaptation. Now, the... Yeah, so this is... There, there are some concepts in this movie that require a lot of explaining, and really the movie kind of expects you to be ready for some of these subject without like it it doesn't ah, what's the word you don't have to know these concepts already but it you, you have to be pretty quick at picking up and some some of the stuff they do explain like they verbally walk you through they, it, they don't spend forever on it but, you know, they do verbally walk you through some of these concepts. And some of the other concepts, like, you get... You get some visual kind of... Uh, what's the word? Yeah, you know, you can you can tell from... You, you see what can they do, what can't they do, where are the limits, th that kind of thing. It handles plot twists incredibly well. There aren't too many, but it seems like, like if you just sat me down and told me, I, I didn't count, but like, I don't know, 20 maybe, I, I don't know. I suppose some of those are more, are not necessarily quite plot twists. They're just, they're surprises. But there are some really major plot twists in this movie, and yeah, it seems like it should be, it sounds like it's too many, but somehow it isn't. None of them are bad, and none of them are too easy to figure out for the viewer, although if you, like, if, if you watch it already knowing some of the, the things, then you pick up on a lot of little hints. And, and on rewatches, you pick up hints, you know, and, and, you know, when, when, when you do that, you're like, how, how could I possibly have missed this before? But, you know, the, yeah, they're, they're really good at hiding the details really subtly. And this is not one of those movies that have a twist that just ruins everything. And... Yeah, so I definitely have to watch something else by these directors and writers. I don't know. I guess no. I I don't. I don't think. I think Lego Movie. I don't. I used to love Legos, but I don't think I've ever wanted a movie based on 
Lego specific, like sure some of the properties that they licensed, but Lego specifically, I don't know. Maybe if, when it came out, if I was just still a kid, maybe I would. But no, I, I, I mean, Spider Verse Two. They're work. Some of these same people are working on it. That's probably gonna be the thing. And I definitely also have to watch like. I knew some of these actors, you know, Ryan Tyree Henry, Mahershala Ali, I'm sorry, I'm blanking on her name, but she was on Dexter, and she voices, I want to say her name is Rio, she's Miles' mother, and I know some of John Mulaney's stand-up. I, I, I'm pretty sure he's acted in other stuff before. This is the first thing I see him act in. Or hear him act in. And, I mean, Haley Steinfeld is going to be in Hawkeye. So that's going to be the second thing I see her in. But other than that, no. Not familiar with her. But but yeah. the the I would say his name is Shamik Moore. The voice is Miles Morales. And... Jake Johnson, I don't know, I, I heard some people say that this is the one thing they found him funny in, so I guess it's possible that I wouldn't like the other stuff. Right, and, and Zoe Kravitz also gives a great performance. I've seen her in a few other things where she was also really good. But anyway, so the directors are Bob Persichetti... So far, the first and only thing he's directed, Rodney Rothman. Also, first, so far, only thing he's directed. And Peter Ramsey, who directed 2012's Rise of the Guardians, which I don't really know. Yeah. I think they did an incredible job. Like, the nothing, nothing overstays its welcome or is overly rushed like there's definitely things like I could watch these action scenes some of these action scenes have so many moving elements that move so fast I could watch them you know I don't know five times ten times and still be picking up new details but you can like you can follow it like you're not confused about who's winning it or losing or what is basically going on, which considering some of the creative action scenes in this, like, it's, it's, some of the scenes in this should not work. Like, by all rights, people should walk out of the movie, you know, after the, the whole movie's played, the end credits, and they'd be like, I mean, I like the movie, but wow, that one action, I, I just lost track. Somehow it doesn't happen. It's the, the, their sense of visual storytelling isn't just it's wild it's i i've it's been a really long time since i've seen something that was this incredibly well told visually because there's there's so many things that they don't really make a big deal out of but you do see it you know they don't talk about it but we see it and yeah the 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 performances are incredible, you know, like, I think a lot of times people underestimate voice acting. It's really difficult, you know. I've done a tiny bit of acting and voice acting, and it is just because you're just you're standing in a room and there's a microphone in front of you. Very typically, the room's going to be fairly dark. You know, like it's, it's, I haven't done green screen acting, but I can imagine even green screen acting is easier than voiceover acting. And just, yeah, it's, it's essentially when you watch one of the characters in this movie move and you hear them talk, what you are hearing them, the way they're talking should sound to you as if they are actually experiencing what we're seeing the animated character experience. That's 
otherwise the illusion doesn't work. You know, a bad voice performance completely takes you out of it. I've, I've seen a couple of cases where that happened, and some of the most talented actors I've ever seen have a really difficult time doing voice acting. And somehow, like, and the and these are, like, I don't know, maybe some of them are voice actors, but certainly several of them are, usually, you know, usually when you see them, you see them in live action. And, yeah, I, just incredible, let's see, what other aspects go under direction? The, the design stuff, you know, the director doesn't sit down and design every single thing, but he has to the three of them have to sign off on these things. You know, they have to look over all these designs, color choices, animation styles, all of this. And, I mean, they'll, they, they have to look at just something in the abstract and somehow judge in their mind, yes, this tiny thing that I'm looking at right now, when they blow it up on a huge screen, IMAX, was, was this released in 3D? I feel like I read that this was originally released in 3D. 3D IMAX, this is going to look good. This is going to be visually appealing in that situation, not only right now when I'm looking at it, for just, you know, yeah. Does that leave anything? I think that covers everything. Just incredible directing. That's also a thing, like, it's difficult to direct live action. Once again, I have a little bit of experience with it myself. But directing animation, like, at, at the very least, you know, when you're dealing with live action, you know, you can say, okay, show me how, you, how are you going to do it. And you look in the uh, viewfinder, I guess it's called. I've, it's been a while. I'm rusty. The, the you know, you, you see... Yeah, you know, I, I mean, on some cameras, what you see when you look in the viewfinder is how it's going to look when the, you know, when you have it in the editing room. You can have a pretty good idea of how everything's going to look, but with animation, like, it's going to be a while where you have to imagine what it looks like when it's moving. You know, it's like, by all rights movies maybe especially animated movies should never work like if you if you try to explain it to an alien they'd be like that's never gonna work that's ridiculous they'd say it in alien language of course i'm translating for your benefit i'm fluent in all alien languages but somehow it does it's it's ridiculous I'm really glad that I'm going to be seeing Haley Steinfeld in another young hero role after this, because yeah, I I that's that's really honestly, I'm not 100% ruling out. No, no, I I was gonna say the the what's it called Bumblebee. I don't think I'll ever watch a single one of the Transformers movies. I know, I know. Bumblebee, very not Michael Bay, very different. You know, everyone I've heard, you know, yeah. People say it's the best one. It's the one good one. I don't know. I, I, anyway, no, currently I'm not going to, but I'm, I'm going to find other stuff she's been in and yeah. Now, so the very opening of this, we get a very quick summary of Peter Parker's life as, you know, yeah, him becoming Spider-Man, saving the day, all of these, you know, and not long after we meet Miles, and it's a really great contrast between the two of them you know you really do because at the end of the day again Peter Parker's Spider-Man is also supposed to be something you can relate to and 
basically the the retelling at the start of this there's a lot of stuff in there that you know kind of difficult to relate to you like the basic idea is at first you relate to him and then later it, you know like Spider-Man goes through a lot of stuff that you really don't ah what's the word that that the rest of us are not and but but yeah you know the when we first meet Peter Parker in comic books and and the the movies he's easy to relate to and when we first meet Miles he's easy to relate to and the the opening bit is is great i there's some there's some they do some fun stuff with the logos i think that's all i'm going to say the ending is incredible. I'm not going to give away whether it's happy or sad. I will say it fits with what came before. There are no deus ex machina or convenient writing. I I was surprised by how well it wraps up everything. Like it really again like if you like the the directors must have had like a long you know that they like had the the themes written out and like the the various story beats and all this and somehow they made it all work like it it's it's wild i just yeah and the ending titles are great there's some you know for the first few minutes of the ending titles there's animation you know af after that it goes to just black screen with white text but the animated the yeah the animated part is really great there's a, there's a lot of good like if if you're if you don't usually sit through credits make this an exception and there is a post credit scene at the at the very very end and it is worth sitting through the end credits now the let's see so i'm going to briefly talk about this as an adaptation i have not read the the comic book storyline that it is based on as far as I can tell, the overall comic book storyline would have taken much, much longer than the, you know, what is it? Uh, I think an hour and 41 minutes of, of movie. It seems like they did a really good job zeroing in on the best stuff to adapt. One thing I noticed when I watched the video by the YouTube channel Variant Comics summing up the complete storyline of Spider-Verse in the comics is that although it has some of the unusual characters like Spider-Ham, Spider-Man Noir, it doesn't actually draw them all that different from the other characters and drawing style the way that this movie does. In the comic, Spider-Ham's spider suit has somewhat muted blues and reds, and the colors are not that far away from the regular Spider-Man suit. Spider-Noir, Spider-Man Noir isn't truly in black and white it's just that his suit is black and white rather than red and blue i'm not saying that's a weakness of the comic i'm saying it's a strength of the movie i wouldn't expect it of a comic which they have to get out in much less time than an animated movie but they make a lot of really smart creative choices in this movie now let's so And there's some some parody that yeah they they really they understand the the origin the the source material and they're you know they're not just making fun of something they don't understand sometimes that does lead to good comedy but I really appreciate that here yeah. And some of the people who helped make the, let's see, I, I want to say, 
I'm, I'm afraid I forget the names, but some of the people who worked on some of the stuff that inspired this movie have expressed that they they thought this was a good they they did a good job on this. The people who adapted it. There are countless things, countless times that this movie subverts expectations. You know, Filmento made an entire video specifically focused on that and how well it works for the movie, how much better the movie is for it. And so, yeah, the, the superpowers, you know, if you're used to Spider-Man, you already know the basics such as webbing, spiral sense, and such. You know, if, you, if you're not familiar with the some of the characters that are... Ah, what's the word? Some of the characters in this that are not from the... You know, that are not Peter Parker, then... Yeah, there, there are some that might surprise you. And, yeah, it follows the source material. They're used well a lot. It's easy to follow. There's not too much. And that brings us to the characters. And some of the characters you don't learn that much about. You just get, you know, they do a few things that speak volumes. But yeah, you know, if if you have trouble getting into a movie where, you know, there are major characters that you don't learn that much specific about, then you might have trouble with this one. And... The movie really inspires empathy for Miles, Peter, others that I'm not sure I'm going to bring up in the review portion. Now. So, Shamik Moore plays Miles Morales and Spider-Man. An intelligent and rebellious teenager of African American and Puerto Rican descent who is imbued with spider like abilities after being bitten by a mutated spider. And producers Lord and Miller describe the character as unique among Spider Men because of his Brooklyn upbringing, his Puerto Rican and African American background, and the fact that his family is still alive, with that family dynamic being central to the film's story. And according to IMDb Trivia, Shamik Moore has been a fan of Spider-Man since childhood. And he's quoted as saying, In fact, when I was a teenager, I wrote in my diary that one day I would play Spider-Man. He's very proud to be a part of Spider-Verse because he says, It's important to point out, Spider-Verse is the first movie about a biracial superhero ever. His culture, background, and upbringing really makes him a different type of superhero, something we've been eager to see on the big screen for a very long time. He's one of the most relatable of all the Spider's Man that we've met in movies. They found a really good balance between him being a nerd, which we're also used to Peter Parker being, and him being likable and appealing, something that some of the live-action Peter Parker depictions had trouble with. Tobey <laughs> Maguire. And, yeah, so, quoting fellow critics, Spider-Verse is an instant classic, not for visuals that will, after all, only be singular until the next ground is broken, but for the tremendous care it's taken in fighting Miles' heart and then things to fill it, break it, strengthen it. Spider-Man Into the Spider-Verse has more heart than Homecoming, more impressive visuals than the Doctor Strange, and is more daring than Infinity War. I'm not 100% I, certain I agree with that last one, but... But the first two are true. The voice cast couldn't have been better. I've been saying how Shamik Moore would make a perfect Miles Morales ever since I saw him in Dope, and he doesn't disappoint here. Much like Margot Robbie's Harley Quinn or J.K. Simmons' J.J. Jameson, Shamik Moore is Miles Morales, as far as I'm concerned. He knows Morales' ambition, his selflessness, his emotional vulnerability, his overall shyness in one of my favorite comic book movie performances ever. You could not have picked a better actor for this role. 
most people don't know who Miles Morales is, and after this film, you'll want to learn more about him because of how they made him so relatable in this film. He acts like a typical teen in this situation compared to other versions of Spider-Man. Other versions kind of just acted like they always knew how to use their powers, and when Miles struggles with his... When Miles struggles with his... Miles isn't the only relatable character in the film, they all are. Jake Johnson as Peter B. Parker in Spider-Man. I should clarify, the following is directed from Wikipedia. Miles' reluctant mentor, a dis disheveled, jaded, and brown-haired 38-year-old counterpart of the hero, he is intended to be an amalgamation of all pop culture Spider-Man adaptations and interpretations. Lord Miller envisioned him to be like the Karate Kid's Mr. Miyagi if Mr. Miyagi doesn't know anything, which they thought was a really neat color to put onto Peter that we hadn't seen before. And IMDb trivia, during the coronavirus pandemic, Jake Johnson offered to record free personalized messages as Peter B. Parker for children under quarantine. That's really sweet. That's, yeah. At a, uh, during a flashback sequence, when Peter B. Parker recalls his marriage to Mary Jane, he steps on a glass at the end of the ceremony. Many viewers took this as an indication that Peter B. Parker was being depicted as Jewish, an interpretation that was later verified by this movie's co-director, Rodney Rothman. In his February 2019 interview with Jerry Miller in the Jewish Journal, and since Stan Lee was Jewish, and there are entirely too few Jewish, especially openly Jewish superheroes, this is another great bit of representation. Chris Pine as Peter Parker, Spider-Man. The younger, blonde-haired, blue-eyed version. And this version of Parker was intended to be as competent a Spider-Man as possible and combines elements from previous Spider-Man portrayals, but with slight differences. And... I suppose... I'm not going to say who Haley Steinfeld is playing. And... Yeah, the... I, I'm just going to say she does a really great job. And Mahershala Ali plays Aaron Davis, Miles' uncle, and again, like I mean, is Mahershala Ali capable of giving a bad performance? I, I'm not sure. I believe that he is. And Brian Tyree Henry as Jefferson Davis, Miles' father, a police officer who views Spider-Man as a menace. At the age of 35, Henry had said he was too young to portray a father of a teenager, but agreed to the role after learning that Miles Morales was the only black Latino Spider-Man. And he gives an incredible performance, and that's again, like... So other than this, I've seen him in Joker, and before that, Widows, and... I mean, he has a very small role in Joker. His performance is great, but... He doesn't get a lot of time to shine. In Widows, he's really, really great. And, you know, it, it helps that the characters are incredibly different. So it's not just, oh, he plays that one thing really well. No. He can he can really play incredibly different characters. And... Yeah, I don't think I'm going to be commenting on... Yeah, Zoe, yeah, Lily Tomlin, Luna Lauren Velez, Zoe Kravitz, John Mulaney, Kimiko Glenn, all of them give really great performances, and let's see, um, I guess I'm going to... 
and and Nicolas Cage, who's like, you know, with Nicolas Cage, very frequently you know you're gonna have fun watching him, or in this case, listening to him. This is one of the ones where he also gives a really great performance. And let's see. Um, Yeah, I don't think I'm going to give away here what exactly. So, let's see. Catherine Hahn does a really great job playing a scientist. Lee Schreiber plays Wilson Fisk slash Kingpin. And... Yeah, a crime lord and benefactor, and yeah, he's he's incredible. You know, Lee Lee Schreiber. I've already I've always thought he was incredibly talented. You know, the first thing I saw him in was Scream, and like one of my few criticisms of that movie is that he doesn't have a bigger role than he does in in that movie. Now, yeah, so following us from IMDb Trivia, the movie's main villain, Kingpin, is one of producer Phil Lord's favorite characters. He says his physical presence doesn't leave room for anything else. He can just stand there and everything bends to his will, even the camera. He's basically this pure black figure and the most abstracted animated character I've ever seen. And... So yeah, the I suppose that is it for the yeah the. Right, the, the, there's a, a cameo. Stanley has a cameo playing J. Jonah Jameson. Stanley, R.I.P. And that's a reference to his long-standing claims that Jameson is an exaggerated potshot at himself. And he had actually expressed that he wanted to play the character in live action. So, you know, even though it's not live action, he did partially get to do this thing that he'd wanted to for a number of years, so that was really cool. I think when, like, if I recall, the, the, let's see, when, when Sam Raimi started, you know, when, when they went into, like, pre-production on the first Spider-Man movie, you know, Stan Lee was like, can I play, you know, would, would it be okay if I played, you know, and the, and, and Raimi, you know, was a fan of Stan Lee, he, but he was like, I mean, I'm gonna, I'm gonna show you what, you know, ah, I can't believe I'm blanking on his name, um, Yeah, the, the, you know, the guy who ended up playing the, the J. Jonah Jameson. And, you know, Stan Lee watched the, the tape and he was like, fair enough, he's better. He's, he's incredible. Now. They put in a bunch of comic book characters from Spider-Man comics, especially that we wouldn't usually see, and they're you know they're they're so weird and, and obscure, but that's part of why you should put it in the movie, and I'm really grateful that they did. They they did an incredible job, and multiple, I guess most of the major characters 
have arcs of their own and there are a lot of great character moments but basically every character gets like if you're anything more than an extra in this movie you're gonna get some really great character moments some defining character moments and quoting a fellow critic the movie is incredible it's not just the ultimate spider-man it's the ultimate spider-man movie most movies tend to focus on a few characters and forget the rest or focus on lots of characters but they don't have enough screen time for each of them the movie pulls it off no it's still done where each character is on screen for an appropriate amount of time where you can invest your emotions in each of them you can also distinguish each character due to their unique personalities and designs and every single character is redeemable except for the villains and let's see. so the there's some really great dialogue and and some of the characters we see in really varied circumstances so we if we see what they're like when things are going well how they respond to things going wrong and that brings us so the the There isn't technically one cinematographer for the movie since it's not live action. You know, technically a bunch of the animators all have to be cinematographers. It's easy to follow when something suddenly happens, like action scenes. The movie doesn't have hyperactive cinematography when it should be calm. There are no unnecessary shots. And with editing... Yeah, the editing keeps it easy to follow fast-moving scenes like action scenes. It keeps more calm when that is called for. There are no scenes that should be cut. I don't personally think any of them should be trimmed down, but I understand some people do. And, yeah, so the animation. You know that really cool visual trait that looks great in animation and has a really strong impact on the viewer regardless of what your answer is that appears in this movie and it's amazing the animation is one of the movie's greatest strengths for some of it they basically took comic book frames animated them and put them on the silver screen I mean that very literally it has word balloons impact lines dialogue boxes you know the, the boxes with text that narrate or describe what happens there are jagged lines to ins indicate spy active spider sense, all of it. Some of these things I haven't thought that much about since I stopped reading comics. You know, once again, what was that? F 14 years ago. And it was a massive dose of nostalgia to watch. At times, the, move the animation moves incredibly quickly. It can be very extra, but it's not like this throughout the entire movie so it's less likely to exhaust the viewer although I've read reviews where people said they were ultimately exhausted by the movie and I can understand that and as cinema wins points out it manages to mix multiple very different animation styles and I think yeah spoilers for the movie maybe minor but spoilers there's one character that's entirely black and white. There's an anime character who will do very anime poses. And there's there's one who is a cartoon character. And and that's like other people look at him and say that's that's a cartoon character, you know, and and he does cartoon character things and somehow they manage to make it work without tonal clash. It's it's wild. It should not be possible. No more spoilers for the time being. With a comic book, like with a regular book, hypothetically, you can spend a really long time on just one part as you read, completely unlike movies. Some video games do also allow you to linger, 
Thus, a number of comic books have incredibly detailed drawings you could spend a long time looking at without running out of interesting things to look at. And this movie does that with some sequences, which makes the movie even more rewatchable than it already was. Quoting IMDb Trivia, The unique animation style of Spider-Verse aims to make the viewer feel as if they are in, a page, in the pages of a comic book. According to Phil Lord and Christopher Miller, the film combined the latest computer-generated animation technology with hand-drawn artistry. It was very important to us that every frame of the movie was refined by the artist's hand after the visuals were rendered by computers. If you freeze any part of the movie at any time, it will look like an illustration with hand-drawn touches and all. It was Peter Ramsey's idea to hold off on the visual comic language, word bubbles, panels, etc., until Miles is bitten by the spider. Spider-Verse played with lighting, or lack thereof, as another way of making the film seem more comic book-like. Art director Patrick O'Keefe says we used dark shapes with just glimpses of light to describe them. It really extended the range of what we could and did put up on the screen. That's, yeah, just briefly, like, the the colors, the lighting, the the movement, all of it is incredibly well animated. And let's see. And yeah, so from Wikipedia, during initial development, the directors worked with a single animator, Alberto Mielgo, to establish the film's look, although Mielgo was let go by Sony before the movie had been significantly produced due to artistic differences, this number eventually grew to 60 animators during production. It became clear that they could not complete the film on time, so the crew was expanded further. The number had reached 142 animators by August 2018, and at one point to 177 animators. The largest animation crew that Sony Pictures Imageworks had ever used for a film. Yeah, it's, it's unreal. The CGI animation for the film was combined with line work and painting, and dots and all sorts of comic book techniques to make it look like it was created by hand, which was described as a living painting. This was achieved by artists taking rendered frames from the CGI animators and working on top of them in 2D, with the goal of making every frame of the film look like a comic panel. Or described this style of animation as totally revolutionary and explained that the design combines the in-house style of Sony Pictures animation with the flavor of comic artists such as Sara Pacelli, who co-created Miles Morales, and Robbie Rodriguez. To make the film feel more like a comic book, it was animated without motion blur, instead using an older technique called motion smearing, first seen in the 1942 Looney Tune short The Dover Boys. The frame rate varied between 24 images animating on ones and 12 images animating on twos per second, the latter case using the same image twice. Producers described the effect as making the animation crunchy. Sometimes the two frame rates would be used in the same scene, such as when and see, yeah, Miles and Peter are both swinging. Miles was animated at 12 frames to show his inexperience, while Peter was animated at 24 frames to give him smoother movement. To create depth of field, another technique was used, deliberately misaligned colors as if the colors had been slightly misprinted, as happens with ink printing in real comics. Other methods to make the film look more like a comic book were halftones and bendet dots to create colors, tones, and gradients, crisscross lines to create texture and shadows, curvy crackle to create the illusion of energy, motion lines to show movement, and onomatopoeia words on the image to represent sounds and motion. And the CMYK offset is a technique taken straight from the comics. It's, it's used not for styling, but to provide motion blur, depth of field, lighting, and color accents. And different co comic styles were emulated throughout the film from different characters. And let's yeah, so, spoiler, minor spoiler, but spoiler for this movie, 
Spyro Gwen's animation based on the designs in her comic, Spider-Man Noir having a black and white color scheme, and Spider-Ham being designed as cartoony as possible. And, oh, right. And Brad Jones says, Spider-Ham lives in a Looney Tunes world. He can float if there's a freshly baked pie. He whips out a mallet to fight enemies, drops anvils on people. No more spoilers. And, yeah, from a critic's comment section, I can't wait to see this again in non-3D and compare the two. Some of 3D during the final fight and the chases through the city were excellent. Nice to see non-Japanese filmmakers finally get super dynamic with the camera in animation too. Limitless camera movement is one of the strengths of the medium. And... So that brings us. So the budget was 90 mil and it earned $375.5 million at the box office. So yeah, it was it was kind of a success. You you could call it a success. That would be a fair assessment. And, yeah, the, the action scenes really great. Like, the dynamic movement is, is a strong suit of it. And, you know, there's a good variety to it. There's chases on foot and in vehicles. And with the use of webbing, there's physical fights. <laughs> yeah, a, cu a couple of superpower, major superpower uses. And just, yeah. And that brings us uh, scrolling through my notes here. Here we go. Yeah. So the the antagonists, the yeah the the villains are very memorable. Like very yeah. And our protagonists are very memorable and very charismatic. And the villain's plan does make sense, and that's a good thing. And the hero's plan makes sense, and that is also a good thing. The music is great. So the, the person in charge was Daniel Pemberton, and the only other movie... I've seen where he handled the music was Birds of Prey, but he did a great job in with both of these. Great score, great use of licensed music that captures the mood of the scenes of the audience members. And let's see. So quoting a fellow critic here, the best part is the soundtrack. It is never obtrusive and always on point. Led by the promotional single Sunflower by Post Malone and Sway Lee, the hip-hop and pop-inspired score and soundtrack is absolutely blissful. Ever since the Black Panther soundtrack blew me away, I feel that I now love this music in everything. And... Yeah, so the, the soundtrack... Artists on the soundtrack include Juice World, R.I.P., Post Malone, Sway Lee, Nicki Minaj. He, he, I'm, I don't follow music that much, but I'm pretty sure Juice, Juice World is. I, I heard that he died, so yeah. Sway Lee, Nicki Minaj, Ski Mask, The Slump God, Jaden Smith, Lil Wayne, Ty Dolla Sign, and Extend, Extentation. And they also released Pemberton Score. And. On December 20th, Sony Pictures Animation announced an extended play album, A Very Spidey Christmas, based on a throwaway joke at the beginning of the film, and consisting of five Christmas songs performed by cast members Shemik Moore, Jake Johnson, and Chris Pine. The EP was released on digital platforms the next day, and today it's also on YouTube. It's, it's legal. It's on Sony Pictures Animation, official channel, so completely free, legally free to enjoy. I heartily recommend it. They're great. They're, they're so much fun to listen to.
There's some great sound design. Like, sound design is extremely important for animation because nothing you see is real. Not, not a single... I'm talking about... The, the kind of animation we're talking about here. None of it is real. None of it happened in real life. So, you know, when someone... You know, every, every time someone punches someone else or there's... You know, someone bumps into some, you know, whatever. You have to get every single, every, every single one of those noises you have to create. You have to go find them somewhere in real life and then make them fit the animation. And they did an incredible job. And the, as, as far as the comedy goes... The movie comments on tropes. The movie literally opens with Spider-Man, the first one, retelling his origin since, you know, this is the fourth iteration of Spider-Man in 16 years. And three of the four, including this one, start with the origin story. So, yeah, you know, the the it was kind of necessary to comment on how many times we've seen it. But if you have no idea, you know, if you just came from another part of the multiverse, you have no idea who Spider-Man is. Your life is very poor, but this is the movie, you know, this movie is going to help set things right. Because hypothetically, you could, I'm kind of, I'm toying with the idea of showing this to someone I know who knows nothing about Spider-Man and seeing how they react. Because technically, it does tell you the things you need to know. Like I said, some of it is communicated visually, not verbally but yeah quoting a fellow critic there's a perfect balance between humor and pathos a regular stream of jokes occasionally intersected with moments of real heart 100 percent. like it got yeah like it really gets you it there, there's some really sweet and sad moments in this and you know that's important to get Spider-Man right. That is part of the Spider-Man. Yeah. Now, largely the movie is set in a real world. You know, there, there are a couple of, you know, yeah, a couple of things. The laws of physics largely apply. And there are not many contrivances. Now. So, pacing. If you don't watch a lot of animated movies, keep in mind a lot of them move much faster than live-action movies, this one included. And, let's see. Yeah, so, some people say that they're, the movie is too... Like, it's, it's too extra. It's, it's, it needs to slow down. I can understand what they mean. I don't really agree. Now. Yeah, so Yeah, some people say that the second half of the movie moves too fast and juggles too many characters. And Now, the movie is an hour and 41 minutes long without end credits, an hour and 52 minutes long with them. And yeah, you know, if you're, if you're not interested, about 30 minutes into the movie, the movie probably isn't your kind of thing. And I'm not saying it's for everyone. I can understand, like, for some people it will move too fast. You know, it, it was made for young audiences, you know, children, teenagers, and, you know, 
peop yeah, parents with very young children. You know, if you're, I, I don't mind, mean to sound ageist, but I could imagine it might be, it might feel just exhausting to watch if you're like grandparent age, you know, that, and, and yeah, I, I don't mean that as an insult, it's just, you know, watch, watch trailers before you sit down and watch the movie, if you think there's a chance it's too fast for you. I did, and that's part of how I figured that, okay, it won't be quite too fast. There are movies that move too fast for me. Now... So, the... Yeah. No matter how much I love a movie, I try to find something to criticize so you know point to something and say what is the what is the worst aspect of the movie and ultimately the core story of a teenager coming into their powers becoming spider-man is a bit straightforward there's not much there we haven't seen before like the the th the stuff that makes it interesting are the the visuals the other characters miles too not not only miles and his story are interesting but a lot of the story beats are things we've seen before i don't think it's a very big deal and you know if you yeah it it's less frustrating if you go into the movie knowing that you know adjusting your expectations And the worst aspect, according to others, some people think it's too silly. I, I mean, I guess I kind of get what they mean. Uh, again, I mean, at the end of the day, the movie is made not exclusively for children. And certainly there's some great animation that's, m that's definitely not made for children. You know, Akira, amazing movie. Do not show it to a child. They will have nightmares. The... the it's made to be child friendly so there's going to be some silly stuff I don't think there's too much or that it's too silly but again you know if you go into the movie knowing and adjusting your expectations it won't yeah it I don't think it will bother that many people statistically speaking and I do not think it's a big deal so yeah the the thing I was most worried about was that it just moved so fast that, like, I love watching movies, but I don't want to be exhausted watching a movie, you know. I was I was worried that it would simply move too fast, and the movie exceeded my expectations. It managed to find a balance. Every so often, there'll be a slower, less intense segment and you can catch your breath. The thing I was most looking forward to was a love letter to the aspect of the movie that's a love letter to comic books and the movie exceeded my expectations. Now the movie is entertaining to watch. It does also like really get to you like emotionally you know if you're already like really emotional and maybe wait to watch it until you're less un unless you don't mind that now let's see the trailers do give away too much those you know I found one that's two minutes and 41 seconds and one that's two minutes and 44 seconds and just yeah, you know, if you really want a lot of surprises, you know, don't watch the trailers. But on the other hand, the trailers do give you a really good idea of what the movie's like. If you like the trailer, you're more likely to like the movie than if you don't like the trailer. And... Let's see. So, yeah, the... the
when the trailer for the film was first released at the start of June 2018, what does that say? For, uh, car for Cartoon Brew, Amid Amidi praised the trailer for focusing on drama rather than action and for seemingly targeting a slightly hipper, more urban, and teen-oriented crowd. And... And, and someone else said, It's nice to see a movie just go nuts and embrace the weirdness of comic books and their eternally shape-shifting storylines. And the, the cover and poster possibly give away a little bit too much, but they do also give a good idea of what the movie is like. If you like the covers and the posters, you're more likely to like the movie than if you do not. This movie really shouldn't work for, for so many reasons. And, you know, the fact that it manages to is a testament to the talent and passion of everyone involved. Now, let's see. The, so, this has a 97% on Rotten Tomatoes based on 392 reviews and a 93% audience score based on over 10,000 ratings. So, yeah, people liked it. And yeah, of the of all the there's 382 fresh reviews and only 10 rotten ones. Which yeah, it is certified fresh. On Metacritic, it is it has 87 out of 100 on the yeah the the their rating and 8.7 out of 10 user ones and there are 50 Metacritic critic reviews and 440 user reviews and on IMDb it has an 8.4 based on 422,077 MDB users who rated it and 28.9% gave it a 9, 26.7 gave it an 8, 24.7 gave it a 10 and the rest of them don't have a lot, statistically speaking, a lot of votes. Actually, I think it was like 12% for v voted 7. So, yeah, that's a pretty good... Yeah. So, yeah, the movie doesn't really have... Like, there is violence, but it tends to be implied or, like, yeah, handled in a way that isn't very upsetting. And I think that was the, the right way to go. Now. So, and be trivia says that Phil Lord and Christopher Miller had a goal for the movie, inspire young people to become heroes, inspire grown-ups to help them do it, and remind us all that you don't need to be bitten by a radioactive spider to do your part. You are powerful, and we are counting on you. And a critic said, this movie is breathtakingly good in every aspect. Like, I'm questioning my sanity. Is it really as good as I think it is? Yes, 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 yes. Spider-Verse shows that there are no actual limits to superhero stories on the big screen, so long as they aren't tethered to how many Robert Downey Jr. quips they can fit. And the, yeah, so the IMDb user reviews, the ones voted the most useful, are overwhelmingly positive. Let's see. 
I recommend this to everyone who isn't too jaded to enjoy it. I even recommend it to people who know nothing about Spider-Man. Just as as if you if you think that you're up for the challenge of picking up everything as you go, you know, yeah. There are 31 and a half minutes of DVD extras. Some really good stuff. There's a Spider-Ham short. It's very much like, you know, he's he is essentially he's practically a Looney Tunes character, and the the short is a Looney Tunes short. And some people really didn't like it. I guess I can kind of see what they mean, but I thought it was great. Then there's you know a bunch of featurettes. One there where the people behind the camera talk about getting the cast they wanted. And we also see the cast talk about their roles and such. There's a tribute to Stan Lee and Steve Ditko. That's great. There's one video where they say there's going to be an Easter egg challenge. And basically, like, they, they go into a bunch of the different Easter eggs. But, you know, there's still a ton that they don't, don't go into. And then there are lyric videos for Sunflower and Familia. And depending on your country, you can stream this on Google Play, Vudu, Amazon, Instant Video, and iTunes. I give this 10 parallel universes mixing with each other out of 10. I'm not saying absolutely everything about the movie is perfect, but I am saying that the things that are good are so amazing that they hugely out, outweigh the, the minor negatives. I think overall the movie might have been slightly stronger if it if if maybe one or two characters at least were trimmed and the the I guess maybe the movie itself should be slightly shorter. Not by a lot, but for how fast it's moving, an hour and 41 minutes is a lot. You know, if, again, if you're not used to animated movies, I've, you know, a number of them are like an hour and 20 some minutes. You know, usually, like, if, if a live action movie is less than 90 minutes, it seems like it's too short. But with animated movies, there's a bunch of them that are that short. And that brings us to the thoughts section start. And it is called Disclaimers. So, if you don't care about these disclaimers, I try to keep them short and relevant, but your mileage may vary. You can skip right ahead to the section of your choice via the description box. I often try to talk very fast during the disclaimers. Since a lot of this is very standard information, I'm not going to keep speaking as fast as sometimes do during the section. One second into the rest of the video itself. With that said, please do note that some of the specific discussion of the movie may be in this section. So, once again, from here on out, I am no longer warning for spoilers, including for the other Spider-Man solo movies. If I talk about the team-up movies, I will verbally warn and hold an index finger. Now, I am ecstatic that this exists as, you know, it's not really a sequel to any of the, but, but yeah, as, as a, you know, an adaptation and a, in some way, spiritual successor to some of the other movies. You know, some part, when they comment on tropes, they can come, the movie can come off across a little cynical and jaded, but overall, it does have that sincerity and joy and, like, it feels things and it feels them very intensely, like the, the three solo Spider-Man series that are in the live action. And I am really, I'm really looking forward to the sequel. It's, yeah. Instead of me quoting all the lines that I love from this movie, let me just say here, I loved every line they put in the IMDb quote section. So 
You can just look that up instead of me sitting here quoting all of them. Now, the rest of this video is not a review. It's a series of, well, thought sums, analysis sums, MSCP, refraction, other jokes. Time codes for all the sections in the description box. The section right after this one is thoughts that I had while watching. You can think of it as a running commentary, live tweeting, or the like. Let's see. I think I'm also going to do the... Yeah. I'm probably also going to do a thoughts that I had before watching section. I, I currently intend to. But if... Yeah, it's not impossible that I'll end up not doing that. I made this video discussing an issue that doesn't affect me or doesn't affect me as much as it does certain minorities. I'm not trying to lecture those that it affects. In part, I'm speaking to others who are not those minorities so we can better empathize with those minorities. And in part, I'm expressing my interpretation of the material without claiming it's as valid as the interpretation of members of the minorities. So this is where I usually get into, does the movie appear to have empathy for the least likable characters? I mean, it does have empathy for Kingpin. I'm not sure that it has empathy for the other villains. We don't really get to know what the... Yeah, we don't, we don't know very much about them, but I do think... I, I really respect that it has empathy for Kingpin. I thought that worked really well. Now, I think the movie does a pretty good job on Gwen. She does a lot of superhero things. She's, you know, she's not like constantly getting saved or sidelined or something. You know, it's, it's really cool that she's actually a much better spider person than um, than Miles is at the start. You know, having having the the girl character be more capable at something that clearly takes skill and practice than the guy character, the the male lead. That's really cool. Now. Let's see, the, the movie does a really great job not overexposing, you know, like, all of the villains remain really cool and, like, they, they you know, they look like someone you wouldn't be able to, you know, that, that it would take a lot to defeat. They do a really good job with that. Really suspenseful. Now, let's see. My making jokes on this should not necessarily be taken as me thinking the thing I'm joking about is actually bad and wanting to make light of the subject, etc. Simply find it very difficult not to MC3K and overanalyze everything I watch. Now, that brings us. To the next section. Notes taken while watching. Even the opening logos are glitching because of the collider. I still, despite it all, I still love being Spider-Man. I mean, who wouldn't? I got somebody I need to introduce you to. I love the reversal of gotta go in a minute between Miles and his and his mother, you know, first let's see, first she's saying, Got you you know, you gotta go and he's like, what was it, eating breakfast or something? And then right after she's like kissing him on the cheek and he's like, I gotta go and she's like, in a minute And Miles walks into the new school, tries to connect, relate to the other students. It doesn't really go well. They basically ignore him. They do really, the, the movie does a really great job, like, with a contrast there. Like, at first, Miles just takes a few steps outside his house, and he's walking through his neighborhood, and he's surrounded by people who know him and like him. And some of them are like, you know, I'm, I miss you. You're, you're no longer in the same school as I am. And, you know, and then he, he trips because of his untie shoelace in front of the, the, 
police car that his father drives, and then his father drives him to the new school. And they also have that, you know... Yeah, interesting. And, and then when he goes into the, the new school, we see that he's not... You know, it doesn't exactly help that his father forces him to say, I love you, Dad, in front of all of them. And it's, you know, it's a very typical... I'm not sure how many... Well, no, it's not supposed to be a realistic moment. It's supposed to be, like, a kind of ridiculous, like, parents embarrass children in front of their friends moment. They're not saying that something like that ha actually happened. So not to very many actual kids, but that, you know, that's what it feels like, basically. Same as how, you know, non the vast majority of people don't have Spider-Man powers, but puberty does feel a lot like the the way that, you know, teenage Spider-Man feels. Now, from the moment we see Dr. Olivia Octavius, she's talking about possible other realities, so it's a really great, and then later, you know, Miles is like, I mean, we saw this video in physics class in, in high school, you know, at the time, like, you don't put together, and, you know, Cinema Winds pointed out, when her name is on the screen, Miles is standing in front of, like, so all we can see is Dr. Olivia O. That, you know, so, so we don't get the reveal that she is Doc Ock from right away, and they also, like, they did a brilliant job, like, hiding, like, the the general look of her. She seems very non-threatening, as Phil Mentor points out. And then, you know, off with the lab coat, and she's got the green suit, and she's got the, the arms. And one of the, on the commentary track, one of them points out that they went, ah, what was it they said? They went with soft tech instead of hard tech, or something like, soft robotics, maybe, instead of hard robotics. Something like that, and I 100% I agree. And and the, the fact that, in addition to like grabbing stuff, you know, they she can turn them into saw blades, and you know, she like grab onto a tree and use it to saw through a tree, grab the different pieces and pull them apart. And from this is comic book stuff, this is the kind of stuff that you, you know. It used to not be in movies at all. Now we're finally getting this kind of, you know, it's just more exciting than just, you know, it. they could easily, like, she has to get from point, point A to point B. There's a tree in the way. You could have her go around, which is super boring. You could have her, like, blow a hole in it, which is also kind of cool. But grabbing it, sawing through it, and pulling it, that's so, that's really cool. This is why we love comic books, you know. Those of us who do, I'm not saying all people do. Nah. And basically the first thing Uncle Aaron says to Miles is, you should go out with a smart girl. So he's made some wrong choices, but some of his values are definitely right. I mean, whether you like graffiti or not, Miles is definitely skilled at it. Right, I want to briefly say, I saw some people say that like, why did the Super Collider send Gwen a week, you know, yeah, back a week when everybody else was dumped? Actually, come to think of it, do we know for sure that they were all dumped at the same time? Anyway. Well, if it can pull Penny Parker from, what was it, the year 3199? Like, there are two options. Either that universe... Well, no, wait, no, because it's still the year 30, 90, 31, 99. There's no, so clearly it morphs some through time. So, so yeah, I, I don't know. I don't really see why the moment that you can pull from different universes in the multiverse, why wouldn't you also be able to go through time? It, it just doesn't seem like that big of a, that big of a stretch to me. Of all the rooms Miles could have gone into, he happens to go into the one belonging to the... I want to say guard, but I guess that's... 
Yeah, I, I don't know exactly what the title is. I've never been to a school like the one that... Yeah. But, you know, yeah, of all the different rooms, he goes into the security, and then right outside, you know, the, the guards come around, and all the... You know, we just see all these arms all pointing at that door. And and the apparently the... Was it Spidey's Christmas album? I Maybe, and, you know... That was like on on the ah was it was it the radio or was it a CD player or something I'm not entirely sure. And the guard is like mm, it's, it's got a good voice. I appreciate the dedication. Like when Miles is is you know accidentally sticking to the wall outside, and then like some some birds, like some of the birds land on his hand and then. It's they can't get free, and so they start pecking at him with their beaks and everything. And so he's he keeps walking around. He's he's trying to get free. Every so often he'll like accidentally, you know, like yeah. Let's see, what is it? Is it that he? Yeah, he he like smacks up against the window or something. And every single time that he that Miles gets back away. The teach, you know, the teacher goes from looking at the window to going back to reading aloud from from the book. Everything I think it happens three times that Miles smacks up against the window and then goes away, and then the teacher returns to reading, and all the students also like just go back to paying attention to him. And we see, you know, and and Miles wants to prove, no, of course it's not, you know, just. It's it's ridiculous how boring the spider is. Look at and then it glitches like oh no. And the the bit with why are all my thoughts so loud is also great. And you know the he's running and like a car comes in so he jumps and lands perfectly and just yeah. You're really, Miles, you are not being very convincing as not being a spider person. And Peter Pine Parker realizes Miles is there, so he saved him, and then he brings up the untied shoelaces, just like his father, just like the other students. Really, the students at both schools, actually, yeah. Now. Yeah, I call him Peter Pine Parker because he's played by Chris Pine. I realized that I could just call him Peter Parker, but then, you know, Peter Parker is also in the comics. Peter Pine Parker is the specific one in this movie played by Chris Pine. I, th I think Chris Pine should play more. Okay, so he's Steve. I can't believe I'm blanking on his last name. Obviously, it's not Rogers. Yeah, um, Wonder Woman. He's in that, and he's in this. I really, I, I hope he gets into more of these. I mean, by now, it is no longer, it's no longer a problem to ap appear in both MCU and DCEU. There are a handful of actors who've done, uh, yeah. I really like that the movie establishes how good Peter Pine Parker is here at the start. So when Miles and Peter B. Parker will have trouble, we have a frame of reference. Also, I want to briefly say, in in reading a bunch of stuff in preparation for this review, I read someone say that you know they got really emotional when they finally realized what the B in Peter B. Parker stands for. I'm not 100% sure, but I think it's maybe Ben, which is legitimately really sweet. And I guess possibly a nod to Ben Riley in the comics, but I'm not 100% certain about that. It is quite clever that the spider that bites Miles comes from the facility with the Super Collider. You know, it's, it's no wonder that the... I mean... Is it that it came from another universe and that's why it's glitching? Or is it just that it came from a machine near them that is, like, oozing radiation or something? 
I'm pretty sure the, the female scientist we hear as the dimensions open is actually Doc Ock, but the movie doesn't tell us that until later, that she's in on it. I mean, we already knew that the, the you know, Dr. Olivia O. something is working at Alchemax, and the, the head scientist. That was also a great bit when Miles and Peter B. Parker have to get in and, and get a new goober, and, you know, Peter is like, I follow the lead scientist. Oh, the, the woman with the bi with the bicycle is actually the lead scientist. I saw her in, in, a, you know, in, a, in a film in school. Cool. I re-examine my biases, and then I follow the lead scientist. And I saw someone whine about, well, why is... <laughs> because a lot of people still have trouble accepting that a number of women are scientists, doctors, politicians, you know, so yes, it is worthwhile to put in the movie. Now, and Peter Pine Parker gives Miles some really great Spider-Man lessons, and, you know, he's always doing the, the right thing, the moral thing. He tells Kingpin it won't work. We know we won't know what he what what kingpin is trying to do for you know a little while but peter Sawan understands his pain but he understands the damage it'll do so he's trying to talk him out of it and kingpin does not take a well not a big fan of constructive criticism of this guy although i guess to kingpin it won't work doesn't sound like to to him maybe it it sounds mean spirited like Let's see, I was thinking, like, you know, Peter thinks it won't work. I mean, I don't, I don't think he expects Kingpin to just immediately give up. But just, you know, if, if you're trying to do something and you find out that it won't work, maybe, you know, eventually you, you stop trying. But, yeah, maybe, maybe to Kingpin it sounded like what Peter Pine Parker said was, you will never, you know, you won't see your family again, no matter what. You'll never be happy again. Again, I'm not saying that's what Peter said, and it's definitely not what he meant, but I think that might have been how it read to Kingpin. If anyone watching wasn't quite sure if Miles really was, you know, as Spider-Man, jumping out of the way of several subway trains ought to do it. And people with no idea about the Spider-Man stuff going on just think that there are earthquakes. We know that it's actually the Collider. Miles' mother is very sweet, and his father tries to be firm. And Mary Jane gives a very sweet eulogy, and everyone's wearing Spider-Man attire, and the great Stanley cameo, you know, can I, can I return it if it fits? It always fits, eventually. And... And the... You know, the rising music makes us think that Miles is going to try to jump off a building, but then he runs down the stairs again and tries to go up the stairs of another building, runs, trips on his untied shoelace, and accidentally breaks the goober. And it was also kind of good, you know, Mary Jane is like, we are we are all counting on you, and or, uh, I, am, I am counting on you, I think she says. And then Miles is like, she's counting on me? And this other guy's like, I'm pretty sure she wasn't talking to you personally. She meant it more as a metaphor. Not enough movies have those. Like when when the when the protagonist makes an important realization, it's like this is you know, and then another character is like, actually, when you really think about it, is more movies need those. There was a while when when a bunch of them had anyway. I really like that Peter B. Parker never narrates the truth when it's about his physical condition and how he takes problems and such. 
like it's it's at, at first I thought it was just gonna be like one thing I mean, you know he's like so I did some push-ups and we see him eating pizza okay you know funny but then it just keeps going and going like I took it really well I did some app crunches I you know all, all of these things like for maybe a minute straight we're seeing something completely counter to what he's narrating and the sequence with the two Spider-Men attached to each other with webbing flying through the city attached to the train car is hilarious. I could spend forever just talking about the gags during the sequence. One of my favorites is the at first happy and then sad snowman face on Peter B. Parker. Just the entire like constructing the scene like so Miles is like I don't I don't think I can be Spider-Man so he goes to Peter's to grave and he's like I'm sorry I don't I'm trying I just don't know if I can and someone is walking up behind him and we actually hear the if you know cinema winds pointed out we hear a you know we hear the the prowler music and the shadow makes him look like the prowler and you know it yeah like the the venom blast like when when Peter puts his hand on his shoulder, you know, that, yeah, you, you, you freak out, you know, when someone walks up behind you and grabs you, yeah, you think it's, it's dangerous. I mean, it wouldn't have killed him to just, like, when, when there's, like, five or ten steps between them for him to say, ah, uh, let's see, what would be a good thing? I miss Spider-Man 2. You know, something like that. Then it's not quite so scary. But he just walks up and just puts the, you know, yeah. And so that makes Peter go flying off. But since Peter, like the, 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 what's it called? You know, the, the shock makes his muscles tense up and makes him do this, which shoots out the webbing. And since he was holding, you know, he, he had his hand on Miles' shoulder, that means there's now some webbing attached to the shoulder. And Miles tries to drag away Peter B. Parker. And then the cops are like, put up, you know, put, put up your hands. And so he does. And in doing so, he accidentally presses the, the, uh, the web, web shooter switch again and the that web attaches to the the it's not a subway right Met, metro whatever the train car and then they get dragged along and like at one point like peter b parker wakes up and he's like what do you do what what is going on and miles is like oh i'm so happy i didn't accidentally kill you And 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 I I like you know then at the end of it they're they're like lying there and people the the New Yorkers are just walking right across like instead of going around or anything and then you know Peter wakes up and Miles has tied him up and he does try to get out by just like flexing his muscles but that that doesn't work and so he talks for a while. And then suddenly he's he's out and he says, watch the hands, not the mouth. And then later, you know, at the end, you know, Miles does that back at him when he gets the goober from him. But the, let's see, the, the, yeah, and, and the, you know, the thing with, you know, how are you still here if, you know, I, I saw you die. Are you a zombie? Am I a zombie? I mean, it's not impossible, to be fair. It's possible that somehow Miles is a zombie. And then, like, I think it is, like, the third guess with this thing of, you know, an alternate dimension. And then Peter B. Parker's like, how did you even guess that like that's that's 100 percent exactly what happened and then miles like oh you know that this teacher or this ah, not teacher this film and school 
the you know physics class yeah now and despite Peter Pine Parker being careful to try to help Miles Peter B Parker doesn't even care that Kingpin's trying to kill Miles he just wants to get home you know it, it's very clear that he is a lot more jaded and they take the bus instead of swinging to Hudson Valley which is also a great like you know if you're a teenager you're like ah you know great we're gonna go to the, you know but Peter B Parker who was a 38 year old he's like do you have any idea how far that is do you know how many miles that is do you want to end up with tennis elbow cuz I don't want to end up with tennis elbow okay we're taking the bus and they don't even they barely even cover up their spider-man suits like just that's really funny and and then like I don't know if like Peter B Parker just whined enough that they did but when they're going back home they also take the bus I don't know maybe Gwen was also like we are we are not thwipping that far we are going to take a bus instead of web swinging that far, you know. And, you know, Miles types in all the ones and then he's like, you know, turns around, what's the next thing? And Peter B. Parker's like, how old are you? Because you don't look a day over 35. And the, yeah, the, that whole bit and and Doc Ock's speed like monologue kind of thing, you know, for like she's like, oh, you know, another Spider-Man. How's how's that? Part? You're from another dimension. That explains the glitching and the body shape. And yeah, you know, you know, if you stay in this universe for, you know, she she does the nerdy thing of pressing up her glasses. If you stay in this universe for long enough your body is going to start just collapsing. It's going to be extremely painful. And I, for one, can't wait to watch. And then Peter's like, what did you say your name was? It's Dr. Olivia Octavius. Let me guess, your friends call you Doc Ock? My friends call me Liv. My enemies call me Doc Ock. And, the, and she's got the oct octagonal glasses and octagonal, like, the the lamps above just yeah it's it's such a great yeah it's it that's a really fun villain reveal you really did not think like you you when when you realized that she was going to catch them you thought well this is slightly annoying you didn't think holy crap she's going to completely destroy them you know just such a great yeah and you know when they were going over the plan Peter B. Parker was like, you know, step six, I grab a bagel. And, you know, th this whole thing. And then when, when you know, when they leave and they say, now to select a bagel. And, you know, he grabs one. And then, you know, all the scientists turn out to all, you know, they, they all have guns. I love the detail. I will admit, I don't think I would have noticed this if I hadn't seen it in IMDb trivia, but. I saw it there, so I paid close attention. One of the scientists is like sitting at the table and just like, oh, Spider-Man, I don't really care. And just turns back to like, I forget, it. I'm not 100% certain, was, were they were they eating or working on a laptop, something. But they, it's not that they don't notice. They specifically like turn and see it and there's, like you can clearly tell they they registered what happened, but they just they don't they don't really feel like it, so they just turn back to them. And that's the kind of thing, like, you know, you could watch the movie ten times and not realize that that, that, that that's there. But if you keep rewatching it, these are the tiny little things that you'll pick up on. And as they you know, as the scientists chase with these laser gun you know, they sh they don't they don't have like guns that fire bullets. And it's not that those don't exist in this movie, because Kingpin has one near the end, Miles grabs it, and let's see, did Tombstone? I'm not 100% certain, I think is fired bullets, but I couldn't, I, I can't say for sure right this moment. But yeah, you know, they're running around, they're firing these big like laser guns, 
And as they chase them, one of them goes, he took a bagel. <laughs> like, that's the important part here. There's two Spider-Mans. They have some of our computer equipment. They might know important secrets. But worst of all, they took a bagel. And Miles puts some distance between him and Doc Ock by going above the trees. Since, you know, when they, when they have trees near them, he can use the, the web to, to swing. But she can use the, the, you know, robot arms to, to get near. But once he gets up above, she can't really follow him there. So that was a quite clever. And Doc Ock actually smiles when she first sees Gwen. Like, there's... I don't know if it's a sense of like excitement at getting a, more of a challenge to fight. Maybe it's like, you know, I mean, the the super collider is her baby. You know, this is the kind of thing that. So seeing the fact, you know, every time she sees more aspects of how well it works, that's that does have to be it's a bit of a boost, yeah. Kingpin's backstory is legitimately heartbreaking. I I like that, you know, at first, it looks like Peter B. Parker is just exhausted, so he's asleep in the back of the bus. So Miles claims that Peter broke the goober, not Miles. And then at the end of the conversation between Gwen and Miles, we realize Peter B. Parker isn't asleep at all. He's just letting them connect because they need it more than he does. They're more ready for it than he is. You know, he realizes he would be the third wheel if they knew that he was awake. So they go to Maze, and it's it's a really great detail that, you know, Peter B. Parker's like, oh yeah, I have a secret shit too. There's a there's gonna be a futon in there. I know how this is. And then they go in, and he's like, you know, he's he can't really deal with how much more equipment this spider-man has so he's just like i mean this guy's really trying way too hard i don't know if it's... calm down there dude we get it spider-man big deal and we meet three spider people at the same time so they get a panel each on screen at the same time and they say their backstories and like talking all over each other is really great and if you pay close attention you do get the detail that peter parker was a spider bitten by a radioactive pig, not a pig bitten by a radioactive spider. And it's just, it's so great. Like, you know, the first of the new three Spider-Men they meet is Spider-Man Noir. And he's like hanging in on, on the ceiling. And like the, you know, the, the K, the, ah, what's it? The jacket is like, you know, blowing in the wind. And, you know, I'm pretty sure it's, ah. Wait, is it Peter or is it, you know what, I'm having a little trouble remembering, but it's either Peter or Miles. It's like, where's that wind coming from? We're in a basement, you know, and personally, I like to think that it's because the scene was rendered using the Nocturne game engine, but, you know, Instead, Spider-Man Noir said, which, I mean, to be fair, they thought that most of the game was going to be set outside in windy times, so, you know, I, yeah, it was probably just easier to make it that the jacket is always blowing in the wind, even when a bunch of the game is set in, inside when there would be no wind. Anyway, the wind follows me wherever I go, and the wind smells like rain, and just wow and then you know penny parker you know and she does the anime poses and she does the the fighting moves and then the spider follows it and then i i want to say peter b parker is the one who says this could literally not get any weirder and then john mulaney walks up it can get weirder and holds up his hand and does the the joke which you know like a reference to how his hands are too sweaty. It's, you know, joke from his stand-up act. And, yeah. 
I really love how how dark Spider-Man Noir is, you know, without without like being, you know, they don't go so far that it, like, I mean, I I don't know that I would show it to a seven-year-old, but a nine-year-old would be able to handle it. I feel like sometimes I let matches burn down to my fingertips just so I can feel something, anything. Can you close yourself off so you don't have to face the repercussions of your morally ambiguous actions? Just, yeah, best Nicolas Cage performance I've seen in a long time. And, you know, and the various spider people all push Miles really hard, and they're, you know, Peter is the only one impressed by him. And so it ends with, you know, Miles just taking the, the elevator back out of there. And he goes back to his parents, or wait. Never mind. What am I thinking of? Ah, ne never mind. Anyway, the scenes of Miles' parents trying to understand him, trying to help him, are legitimately sweet. When the Prowler first goes into Aaron's apartment, at first you're like, how did he find Miles? How did he even know that Miles had a connection to Aaron? But then we realize Aaron is the Prowler. It is a really great twist on the Peter Parker Spider-Man. Uncle Ben dies which tells him that he has to be responsible or people he loves could get hurt, killed miles's uncle is a criminal and ends up dead which tells him that he has to be responsible or he could end up a criminal and dead and penny parker makes a goober really badass i, I really like how they manage to give all of them stuff to do that is like Okay, this is the kind of thing that they would absolutely nail. You know, the she also scans the building with like some kind of la laser thingy. Yeah. I love that one of the villains rings the doorbell at May's place before busting down the door. Like we hear, you know, he's like, "Will you follow?" "No, I'm not I wasn't followed." And then, you know, outside you know, just wow, and and then they go in, and and May's like, live, <laughs> and just like in my mind, they used to like knit together or something, and they would talk about you know, oh that my Peter is just so nice, he helps everybody else, you know, he's so oh, you know, and and meanwhile, live is like, oh you know, can't wait to build that super collider, it's gonna be amazing, you know, just yeah. It's really heartbreaking when Peter B. Parker tells Miles he's not ready. And and the this thing of, like, you got to tell them that I'm ready. It wasn't their decision. And, the yeah, the, just real quick, the fight between all the Spider-Men and all the, the all, all the villains, really, really cool. And, you know, when, when Miles' father has a heart-to-heart -heart with him through the door, you know, finding Aaron dead made Miles' dad, I, I don't remember his name, made him worry that Miles and he would drift apart like he and his brother did. And I, I really like, you know, the, the spider people realize, you know, oh, all the waiters are dressed as Spider-Man. You know, they have Spider-Man masks on, you know, and one of them's like, it can't be that easy. It can't be that easy. It was that easy, you know, and they're just, they, they're they basically not putting on any kind of disguise at all. And just going you know, as, as waiters and the robot is under the table. That's just, that's really great. And, and you know, and Penny's inside the, the robot, like controlling it. And then like grabs, a, I'm, I'm not 100%, some, some kind of candy, you know, you know munches on that. I really love Gwen's, I'm pretty sure multiple face palms at Peter B. Parker losing it with Mary Jane, who just wants bread, just the, it's, it's such a, such a great, like, Peter, it's not your Mary Jane, it's not your Mary, I, I know that, just, so, we want, we need some bread at tape, I know, I, I haven't been there for you the way that you deserve, and I just, I, you, you, you're gonna get the bread that you deserve, and and after a while, Mary, you know, at first Mary Jane is like, okay, um, 
mm -hmm. yeah just and after a while it's just like are you okay it's just like at, at some point she starts to, like feeling like okay this complete stranger is behaving very like this is this is getting kind of okay uh, just, and you know f and just as as peter is when you know you deserve bread they should fill this whole place up with bread for you and you know he leaves with with gwen and she's like are you gonna be okay yeah good because we're not getting any bread <laughs> and the collider started up and there's more glitching in the city and when Miles is invisible and uses Doc's own robot arm to hit her, is that a missed opportunity for a stop hitting yourself joke? And Gwen is about to fall into the beam, so Miles jumps down, helps her just like Peter Pine Parker did for him. Such a creative action climax with vehicles and buildings coming out of the beam and then the spider people jumping off them. It's it's just such great, yeah. I uh, love all of you. I'm taking this cube thing with me. I don't understand it, but I will. And the uh, you know and and Spider Ham disappears. And that's all, folks. Is he allowed to say that? I mean, legally? Friends? Friends. See you around, Spider-Man. That's It's so sweet. Like, her calling him Spider-Man, that's like... He would rather hear her say that than hear her say, you won a, a billion dollars in the lottery or something. You know, just her recognizing him as Spider-Man, that's... Yeah. And Wilson managed what he had hoped. The Collider did bring his son and wife back. And they see him about to kill Spider-Man, just like when they ran away from him last time. It's such a compelling tragedy. How much violence has he committed since they left? He didn't learn non-violence. He didn't try to, you know, find someone new, have a new son, and try to move on. Instead, he kept doing the thing that made him leave, that made them leave. And it's, it's exactly right for a Spider-Man villain. So many of them are such tragic figures. You know, both in the comics and the movies. And Miles defeats Kingpin using the shoulder touch. So he's not going to throw away everything that Aaron's off him. And the Venom blast. Miles' dad tries to encourage the graffiti. <laughs> it's, like, it's kind of adorable. Like, he's, you know... So, um, maybe we could find a wall, like, uh, privately owned, maybe at the police station. And, I don't know, I guess you could throw up some of, some of the, the thing you do. Oh, man, I'm bad at this. <laughs> that's, that's, yeah. And everyone in the neighborhood cheers Miles on a Spider-Man. And, and, you know, the movie ends the way it began with a Spider-Man saying, okay, let's do this one last time. And it's, it's such a great, because at the start, it's Peter Parker. And it's like another one, you know, this is the fourth Spider-Man to open with, you know, the, the fourth Spider-Man, the fourth Peter Parker Spider-Man in, what is it, 16 years? And it's the third of them to open on the origin story, you know. So he says, let's go through it one last time. You know, you know this already. I just, I'm just going through it real quick. Just, you know, let's, you know. And then at the end of this, it's like, okay, let's go through it one last time. Because it's like, we've literally seen, okay, so let's see. There's two Peters. There's Gwen. There's... Ah, uh, let me think. Parker, Peter Parker, Penny Parker, that's five. And now Miles is the sixth Spider-Man that we're getting the origin story in summary for. So it is, you know, 
yeah, let yeah, start at the beginning one last time. So it's and yeah, the the great you know and the other ones were like you know for so and so long I've or since then I've been the one and only Spider Man or Spider Gwen or you know. And then in this one, for the last two days, I've been the one and only Spider-Man. It just, yeah. And and there's some things that I didn't, you know, call out, but just briefly, you know, the leap of faith is amazing. All of the individual music, the the licensed music was great, and the all the fight scenes and the ch chase scenes are great. Great animated credits with all of the different spider people showing off something they're good at. Spider Gwen dances, Spider Ham plays whack a mole with the other spider people as the, the moles, and several of them get to perform music with a band that fits them on stage. You know, noir, I mean, I'm guessing like jazz or something. And yeah, Spider Gwen with the rock band, and for a few seconds, Peter B. Parker, or Peter, Peter B. Parker is roasting Spider Ham, but then for several seconds after that, their roles are reversed. So Peter B. Parker is, you know, in neither case, the the spit doesn't go through the body. It, you know, they're tied to the spit, the way what we see in in a lot of, uh, you know, fiction. I I assure you of that, because in real life, when you roast a pig. Yeah, you might you might put the spit through the the pig. More likely that than tie it. But anyway, yeah, it's it's, it's a really neat like and and yeah, an excellent post credit scene. Okay, let's start at the beginning one last time. Just yeah, and and that is like. They better deliver on that. I really, they, they had better actually give us, let's see, Spider-Man 2099, and he's played by, ah, I can't believe I'm, yeah, I'm blanking on his name right now, but, ah, Poe from the new Star Wars movies, the new Star Wars trilogy. Anyway. So let's see. I guess I think I'm just uh, let's see. I think I'm just gonna stick with yeah. Okay, so I copied in some stuff. Let's see. Yeah, so one critic is quoting a fellow critic here. Then a certain moment happened in the movie where I was taken out of the film and went, wait, oh shoot, this is going downhill real fast. It was in the introduction of all the other Spider-Verse characters. At that moment, the film shifted gears into an entirely different film from the first half. Does Miles Morales fit in with the professionals? Can Miles Morales impress them? Everyone seems to hate him during his due to his lack of, due to his lack, his lack of experience. Can Miles Morales take a leap of faith, which he already did at the beginning of the movie? Is Miles Morales even relevant to the story? All of these sudden new themes and plot developments completely derail what the first half of the film was setting up, to such a degree that it felt like a giant schism cut through the film, and the second half of the film was waving goodbye to the first half. Gwen Stacy has the unfortunate issue of being completely relevant to the story when she should be an important and vital character to Peter P. Parker's slash Miles Morales' character growth and should have an arc of her own. This is a character who witnessed Peter Parker, her best friend, die, and Peter B. Parker is someone who witnessed Gwen Stacy die in her universe. Yeah, why don't they discuss this? Peter B. Parker should be surprised and excited to see someone he knew as dead alive again, and she should be happy to see her best friend once more. Instead, the two characters just punch bad guys like everyone else. No growth or development between the two. Yeah, that it is too bad that they don't... Yeah. And according to Wikipedia, the film was originally set to feature a romance between Miles Morales and Spider-Gwen. While the idea was scrapped, Spider-Gwen was still featured prominently in the film, mostly due to the efforts of producer Christina Steinberg. 
Maybe that's why her character doesn't really need to be in the movie. They removed what she was there for. Considering all the diversity in the movie, it's less insulting than usual that the one thing they thought of for the major female character to do was be a love interest for the male main character. I mean, come on, the problem with Gwen Stacy as a character originally was that she was just the love interest. She was boring, so they made her into a spider person to make her interesting. It worked. And then this movie tries to take her back to that. What they should have done was make fun of the trope. Man, let's see. Yeah, it's, it's, it's kind of... It's wild that so many people can't think of a way to put a female character, make a female character a major part of a movie without her being someone's love interest. Now, let's see. The, uh, there was some other thing with the Gwen Stacy thing. Nah, maybe I'll think of it later. So the IMDb trivia notes that the visuals of the city flying apart in the super collider draw from Akira. And yeah, just real quick. At around 52 minutes during the lab heist scene, all the workers are getting out their guns, except one of them, who decides not to do anything about the problem. So yeah, I forgot I put it in there as well, but... At around an hour and 30 minutes, Spider-Ham's final line, that's all folks, is the tagline of Porky Pig for ending Looney Tunes cartoons, except he says it, he says it with his characteristic stutter. Spider-Ham never once removes his mask, and the outline of his head and body bear a remarkable resemblance to Porky Pig. I... I think I put it somewhere in the in my notes, but I I'm not sure it's coming up. I think I might have anyway. So I just really briefly want to say someone pointed out that John Mulaney does an old timey movie voice, and that's perfect because it is like you know he's not out of a a cartoon a cartoon from today. He's out of a cartoon from you know decades ago, back when Looney Tunes shorts were still a really big deal. You know, so yeah, he he has he, he the the dialect he uses he sounds like someone from Hollywood from back then. So Peter B. Parker's like, what did you say your name was? And we realized she was Doc Ock all along. So the movie opens with this universe's Peter Parker saying that he's been Spider Man for ten years. So I guess in this universe. Sam Raimi's Spider-Man 4 did happen, but was maybe also the last Sam Raimi Spider-Man movie? Wait, is he currently in the fourth Sam Raimi Spider-Man movie? Man, let's see. So, so yeah, that is, like, because, because, yeah, the, the, the fourth movie was supposed to come out like, like the, the reason that Amazing Spider-Man came out wasn't that Spider-Man 3 did poorly. It was that Sam Raimi and Tobey Maguire couldn't put out a another Spider-Man movie before 2012. And if five years pass without Sony making a movie based on Spider-Man, they lose the rights. They revert to Marvel and they didn't want that to happen. So they went with The Amazing Spider-Man instead. So if there had been a fourth Sam Raimi Spider-Man movie, yeah, it would have come out around 2012, which would mean, which would put it about 10 years after the first movie came out. Yeah, it's, because they didn't, it didn't have to be him saying 10 years, you know, he could have said any amount of time, but yeah. And according to IMDb Trivia, the alternate universe, Peter and MJ are divorced, satirical depiction of the Sam Raimi trilogy Spider-Man, is possibly a reference to a scrap plan for a potential fourth film where Peter and MJ would have been married but end up divorced because he cheated on her with Felicia Hardy. Raimi thought that Peter was too much of a jerk and wanted more time than Sony would give to rewrite the script to make him more likable. 
that's definitely an issue. Peter really did become kind of a jerk in Spider-Man 3. And if they took it even further, which it kind of sounds like, yeah, don't, don't cheat. Now, let's see. And yeah, so this is from the comment section of a critic's site. I stand by my initial impression that the film has pacing and tone issues. The precise moment they start is after Miles sees that Aaron is the prowler. Instead of letting the moment sink in for a while, the film immediately cuts to a chase that is very similar to the previous prowler chase, followed quickly by the introduction of Scorpion, then a big goofy group battle, and then the death of Aaron. None of these moments are given a chance to breathe and transition naturally to the next sequence, so the shifts from terror to goofy carefree action to death are too jarring. And one of the critics says that the origin of Miles Morales is really well done, in my opinion. Peter B. Parker is an interesting character, too. Gwen Stacy is also good, but the other three spider people didn't have any purpose other than comedic relief in the story, which is fine. As long as the overarching story is good, it wasn't. Basically, the Kingpin wants to bring back his dead family by collecting them from a dimension in which they haven't died. Maybe this would have been a relatable motivation if this wasn't shown in a flashback, which just seems cheap to me. I mean, that is... This is the first Spider-Man solo movie where the main villain's tragic backstory is relegated to flashback. All of the other ones, we see the trauma, and they could have done it here. That, that would have been, you know, it, it would require a rewrite, but it's doable. It's not impossible. So, I... think I'm really quickly going to find some, because I know, yeah, just really, really quickly, let's see, and, I'm not going to spend forever looking for it, but now that I'm spoiling things, I, let's see, I'm going to talk a little bit about the characters that I didn't talk about before. So let's see. Let's see. Yeah, so the the uh, here we go. Yeah, John Mulaney's Peter Parker slash Spider-Ham, an alternate funny animal version of Spider-Man from an anthropomorphic universe, who was once a spider bitten by a radioactive pig. That really is incredible. And Kimiko Glenn plays Penny Parker slash Spider, and Spider is spelled. Um, yeah, I'm just, yeah, capital S, capital P, slash, I guess, two slashes, and then small d, small r. A young Japanese-American girl from an alternate anime-like universe who co-pilots a biomechanical suit with a radioactive spider that she shares a telepathic link with. Filmmakers initially considered using Silk as their Asian-American Spider-Man, but eventually settled on Penny because of her more distinctive power set compared to the other Spider-People. Penny's designs went through a few iterations, as her initial design was particularly iffy. Production designer Justin Thompson considered Lord and Miller's desire to use an anime design and came up with the idea to create her in an art style similar to Sailor Moon. And... I'm to be trivia says Kimiko Glenn, who voices the anime spider hero in Penny Parker, knows that anyone can be a superhero. She says, One of the coolest things about Penny Parker is that you wouldn't expect this tiny, happy, and energetic young girl to be the heroic pilot of this hulking superbot. 
and Nicolas Cage plays Peter Parker slash Spider-Man Noir, a dark and monochromatic alternate version of Peter Parker from a 1930s universe. Cage, who previously worked with Marvel as Johnny Blaze in the Ghost Rider film series, based, this, based his character on the films of Humphrey Bogart and the voices of actors from that era, such as James Cagney and Edward G. Robinson. He did a really great job. He really does sound like, a, yeah, Cagney and Robinson, yeah. And I did trivia. Nicholas Cage was excited that the directors let him have fun with the role of Spider-Man Noir. Cage says, It's no secret that I like to play with different sources. It was fun to go back in time and pull back a little of that Humphrey Bogart essence. Cage thinks that the movie will appeal both to the adults who like old movies and the kids who will want to learn more about them. And let's see the... I think that might be it. I know not everybody loves a ah, what's it called? The, the yeah, not everybody loves this version of Norman Osborn slash Green Goblin. I thought it was fun, you know. Yeah, I I don't know. When when I heard that he was going to be like a giant and like mutant or something, I wasn't sure if he was going to be using pumpkin bombs, so I'm glad that I was really happy to see that he did. Right, and now, yeah, now I'll briefly talk about, you know, Oscar Isaac plays Miguel O'Hara slash Spider-Man 2099. Yeah, the... I really hope that we get way more of that in the second movie or some sort of spin-off or something. Now let's see, I think that is it. So I'm just real quick gonna find my sign off here we go so if you like this video please comment thumbs up subscribe hit that little bell there should be links a link to my main channel page one or two one two or more links to stuff like relevant playlists a suggested video for you to watch on the screen right about now i put out one vlog per week reviewing and sharing spoiler thoughts on a movie and one talking about the most recent episode of the current Disney Plus MCU show, which is currently What If. And these days, the review and thoughts videos tend to come out very similar to this one. In other words, if you want more like this, you're in luck. You can check out my back catalog as well as catch my video next week. I hope you enjoyed watching as I enjoyed watching recording, and I'll catch you next time.